Hello, everyone. Um, thanks for attending my talk today, and thank you to um, Sapple Tech for inviting me as a speaker. I'm super excited to be here. So my name is Andrew Knight, but you may know me as Pandy for short. I am the Automation Panda. Be sure to read my blog and follow me on Twitter at Automation Panda. For my day job, I am a developer advocate at a company called Apple Tools. If you haven't heard of Apple Tools, they provide visual testing tools to help your app look visually perfect. Pretty cool stuff. I also lead Test Automation University, which is one of the best platforms for upping your testing and automation skills. We offer about 70 courses completely for free from some of the best instructors in the world on all sorts of testing and automation topics. So real quick, if you're new to visual testing and what Apple Tools does, here's a quick way to show you what it's all about. Side by side here are two pictures of an octopus garden. Can you spot the differences between them? Take a moment and see how many you can count. Do, 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 do. Give a few more seconds here for you to try to spot them all. It's like we're kids again, right? Fun times. Five, four, three, two, one. Boop. All right. Voila, there are a total of 10 differences between these pictures. Did you catch them all? Put in the chat how many you found. This here is the power of visual AI. It can detect any visual differences between snapshots in a split second without tripping over things like small pixel shifts. Um, Apple tools develop visual AI to help you automatically detect visual changes in your web apps, your mobile apps, and frankly, any other apps you develop. Uh, you can add visual snapshots to your automated test to catch visual bugs. So that way, anytime your app changes over time, you can pinpoint the root of the problem. I always like to say if a picture is worth a thousand words, then a snapshot's worth a thousand assertions. So in a nutshell, that's what we do at Apple Tools. So visual testing is awesome and all, but that's not what I'm here to specifically talk about today. Just want to give a little background of what I do and what my company does. Uh, what I am going to talk about today is the screenplay pattern, which is a new way to automate your interactions. Now, screenplay pattern isn't exactly new. It's been around for a few years, but it's still new to a lot of folks in our industry. I strongly believe that screenplay is a much better way to interact with web pages than, say, page objects. I believe in screenplay so much that I developed Bow Constrictor, the .NET screenplay pattern. So in this talk, I'll introduce the screenplay pattern in three parts. First, I'll cover problems with traditional ways of automating interaction. Second, I'll explain why the screenplay pattern is a better way. And third, I'll show how to use screenplay pattern with a C-sharp library named Boa Constrictor. So to start, let's define that big I word I was tossing around, interactions. Simply put, Interactions are how users operate software. For this talk, I'll focus on web UI interactions, like clicking buttons and scraping text. Interactions are indispensable to testing. The simplest way to define testing is interaction plus verification. That's it. You do something and you make sure it works. Think about any functional test case that you've ever written or executed. The test case was a step-by-step -step procedure in which each step had interactions and verifications. Here's an example of a simple DuckDuckGo search test. DuckDuckGo, if you're not familiar with it, is a search engine like Google or Yahoo. The steps here are pretty straightforward. Opening the search engine requires navigation. Searching for a phrase, <coughs> pardon me, searching for a phrase requires entering keystrokes and clicking the search button. Verifying results requires scraping the page title and result links from the new page. As you can see, interactions are just everywhere. 
Unfortunately, though, our industry struggles to handle automated web UI interactions well. Even though most teams use Selenium WebDriver and their test automation, every team seems to use it differently. There's lots of duplicate code and flakiness. So let's look at the way many teams evolve their WebDriver-based interactions. I'm going to use C Sharp for code examples, and we'll continue that DuckDuckGo test case. When teams first start writing test automation code using Selenium WebDriver, they frequently write raw calls. Anyone familiar with the WebDriver API should recognize the calls I'm about to show. WebDriver object is initialized using, let's say, Chrome Driver, if we're testing Chrome. The first step to open the search engine calls driver.navigate.gotoURL with that DuckDuckGo website address. The second step performs the search by fetching web elements using driver.find element. It has some locators there. And then it calls methods like send keys and click. The third step uses assertions to verify the content of the page title and the existence of result links. Finally, at the end of the test, the web driver quits the browser for a proper cleanup. Like I said, these are all fairly common web driver calls. Unfortunately, though, there's a big problem here. Race conditions. Bum, bum, bum. There are no less than three race conditions in this code, in which the automation does not wait for the page to be ready before making the interaction. WebDriver does not automatically wait for elements to load or for titles to appear. You've got to do that on your own. Waiting is a huge challenge for web UI automation. And it's one of the main reasons for what we call, quote unquote, flaky tests. You could set an implicit wait that will make calls wait until the target elements appear. But they don't work for all cases, such as the title in race condition number two. Explicit weights provide much more control over waiting timeout and conditions. They use a web driver wait object preset timeout value, and it must be placed explicit through, explicitly throughout the code. Here, they are placed in the three spots where race conditions could happen. Each wait.until call takes in a function and returns true when the condition is satisfied. These weights are necessary, but they cause new problems. First, they cause duplicate code because web element locators are used multiple times. Notice here how search form input homepage is specified twice. Ugh. Second, raw calls with explicit weights make code less intuitive. If I remove the comments from each paragraph of code, what's left is a wall of text. It is difficult to understand what this code does at a glance. To remedy these problems, most teams use the page object pattern. In the page object pattern, each page is modeled as a class with locator variables and interaction methods. So a search page class could look like this. At the top, there could be a constant for the page URL and variables for the search input and search button locators. Notice how each has an intuitive name. Next, there could be a variable to hold the WebDriver reference. This reference would come via dependency injection through the constructor. The first method would be a load method that navigates the browser to the page's URL. And the second method would be a search method that waits for elements to appear, enters the phrase into the input field, and then clicks the search button. This page object class has a decent structure and a mild separation of concerns. Locators and interactions all have meaningful names. Page objects require a few more lines of code than raw calls at first, but their parts can easily be reused. The original test steps can be, re -re blah, blah, blah. <laughs> can be rewritten using this new search page class. Notice how much cleaner this code looks. The other steps can be rewritten using page objects too. 
Unfortunately, page objects themselves suffer problems with duplication in their interaction methods. Suppose the page object needed a method to click an element. We already know the logic. Wait for the element to exist and then click it. But what about clicking another element? The method is essentially hard coded for one button. A second click method would be needed to click the other button. Unfortunately, the code for both methods is practically the same. And the code would be the same for any other method we'd want to have for clicks. This is copy pasta. <laughs> and it happens all the time in page objects. I've seen page objects grow to be thousands of lines long due to duplicative methods like this. No lie. <laughs> Tens of thousands of lines even. At this point, some teams will say, oh, hold on, wait a minute. You got more duplicate code? We can solve that problem with some more object-oriented programming. And they'll create the infamous base page, a parent class for all other page object classes. The base page will have variables for the web driver and the wait object. It'll also provide common interaction methods, such as this click method that can click on any element. Abstraction for the win, right? Child pages will inherit everything from the base page. Child page interaction methods frequently just call base page methods. I've seen many teams stop here and say, ha ha, this is good, right? In my opinion though, this still isn't very good. The base page helps mitigate code duplication, but it doesn't solve its root cause. Page objects inherently combine two separate concerns, page structure and interactions. Interactions are often generic enough to be used on any web element. Coupling interaction code with specific locators or pages forces testers to add new page object methods for every type of interaction needed for an element. Every element could potentially need a click, to scrape text, to check if it's displayed, or any other type of web driver interaction. That's a lot of extra code that shouldn't be necessary. The base page also becomes very top heavy as testers add more and more code to share. More frustratingly, the page object code I showed here is merely one kind of implementation. What do your page objects look like? I bet dollars to donuts, they look different than the ones I just showed. Page objects are completely freeform. Every team implements them differently. There's no official version of the page object compatible. There's no conformity in its design. Even worse, within its design, there's almost no way for the pattern to enforce good practices. That's why you see people arguing over whether page object locators should be public or private, <laughs> or how long they should be, or things like that. Page objects would be better described as a convention rather than a true design pattern. Yeah. There must be a better way to handle interactions. Thankfully, there is. Let's take a closer look at how interactions happen. First, there is someone who initiates the interaction. Usually, this is a user. They are the ones making the clicks and taking the scrapes. Let's call them the actor. Second, there is the product under test. For our examples in this talk, that's a web app. It has pages with elements. Web page structure is modeled using locators to access page elements from the DOM. Keep in mind though, this thing under test could be anything else. It could be a mobile app, it could be a microservice, or even a command line app. Third, there are the interactions themselves. For web apps, they could be simple clicks and keystrokes, or they could be more complex interactions, such as logging into the app or searching for a phrase. Each interaction will do the same type of operation on whatever target page or element is given. Finally, there are the objects that enable actors to perform certain interactions. For example, Browser interactions need a tool like Selenium WebDriver to make clicks and take those scrapes. 
Let's call these things abilities. Actors, abilities, and interactions are each different types of concerns. We could summarize their relationship in one line. Actors use abilities to perform interactions. Actors use abilities to perform interactions. This is the heart of the screenplay pattern. In the page object convention, page objects become messy because concerns are all combined. The screenplay pattern separates concerns from maximal reusability and scalability. So, Let's learn how to screenplay using Boa Constrictor. Boa Constrictor is an open source C-sharp implementation of the screenplay pattern that my former team and I developed at Precision Lender. It is the cornerstone of Precision Lender's end-to-end -end test automation solution to this day. It can be used with any .NET test framework like Specflow or NUnit. The project has rich documentation hosted using GitHub pages, the GitHub repository name is q2ebanking slash boa constrictor. And the NuGet package name is capital boa dot constrictor. Let's rewrite that DuckDuckGo search test from before using boa constrictor. As you watch this talk, I recommend just reading along with the code as it appears on the screen to get the concept. If you're trying to code along in real time, it might be challenging. But after this talk, if you take the official Boa Constrictor tutorial, you can get hands-on with all the code I'm going to share today. To use Boa Constrictor, you'll need to install the, <coughs> pardon me, you need to install a couple packages, Boa Constrictor, REST Sharp, and Selenium WebDriver, all from NuGet. My code example will also use Fluent Assertions and Chrome Driver. Let's begin. It all starts with the actor. The actor is the entity that initiates interactions. All screenplay calls start with the actor. And most test cases need only one actor. The actor class optionally takes two arguments. First argument is a name, which can help describe who the actor is. The name will appear in logged messages. Second argument is a logger, which will send log messages from screenplay calls to a target destination. Loggers must implement Boa Constrictor's iLogger interface. Console Logger is a class that will log messages to the system console. You can define your own custom loggers by implementing iLogger. Abilities enable actors to initiate interactions. For example, an actor needs a Selenium WebDriver instance to click elements on a web page. Read this line in plain English. The actor can browse the web with a new Chrome driver. Boa Constrictor's fluent-like syntax makes its call chains very readable. Actor.can adds an ability to an actor. Browse the web is an ability that enables actors to perform web UI interactions. Browse the web.with provides the web driver object that the actor will use, which in this case is a new Chrome driver object. Boa Constrictor supports all browser types. Before the actor can call any web driver based interaction, the web pages under test need models. These models should be static classes that include locators for elements on the page and possibly extra things like page URLs. Page classes should only model structure. They should not include any interaction logic. Remember, separate your concerns. That way, interactions can target any element, maximizing code reusability. Interactions like clicks and scrapes work the same regardless of the target element. Search page class here has two members. First is a URL string, and the second is a locator for the search input element named search input. Locator has two parts. First part is a plain language description that will be used for logging. Second, it has a query that is used to find an element on the page. You might also call that the selector. Boa Constrictor uses WebDriver's by queries. For convenience, locators may be constructed using a statically imported 
L method. Less text, more fun. With our page in hand, let's look at the interactions themselves next. Screenplay pattern has two types of interactions. First is called a task. A task performs actions without returning a value, just does something. Examples of tasks include clicking an element, refreshing the browser, and loading a page. They all do rather than get. Boa Constrictor provides a task named Navigate for loading a web page using a target URL, shown here. Read this line in plain English. The actor attempts to navigate to the URL for the search page. Again, Boa Constrictor's fluent-like syntax is very readable. Clearly, this line going to load the DuckDuckGo search page. Actor.attempts to is what calls a task. All tasks must implement the iTask interface. When the actor calls, <coughs> pardon me, when the actor calls attempts to on a task, it calls the tasks perform as method. Navigate is the name of the task, and dot to URL provides the target URL. The navigate tasks perform as method is where the magic happens. It fetches the web driver object from the actor's ability, that's that dependency injection happening, and it uses it to load the given URL using a Selenium web driver call. As we remember, search page.url is the URL for our target page. We simply put it in the page class just to make it universally available. In the real world solution, you probably want to put that in like a config file or something. Those are tasks. Let's look at the second type of interaction. It's called a question. A question returns an answer after performing actions. Examples of questions include getting an element's text, location, and appearance. Each of these interactions returns some sort of value. Boa Constrictor provides a question named value attribute. that gets the value of the text currently inside an input field. Read this line in plain English. The actor asking for the value attribute of the search page's search input element should be empty. Actor.asking for is what calls the question. It's kind of like attempts to, but asking for because you now have a question. All questions must implement the iQuestion interface. When actor calls asking for or the equivalent asks for method, it calls the questions request as method. Value attribute is the name of our question here. And dot of provides the target web elements locator. Value attributes request as method, again, is where the magic happens. It fetches the web driver object, waits for the target element to exist on the page, and scrapes and returns its attribute, value. Search page dot search input was that locator for the target element from before. Finally, once the value is obtained, the test must make an assertion on it. Should be empty is a fluent assertion that verifies that the search input field is empty when the page is first loaded. Test case's next step is to enter a search phrase. Doing this requires two interactions typing the phrase into the search input, and clicking the search button. However, since searching is such a common operation, we can create a custom interaction for search by composing two lower level interactions together. The search duck.go test takes in a search phrase. Its perform as method simply calls two other interactions, send keys and click. Using one task to combine these lower level interactions makes the test code more readable and understandable. It also improves automation reusability. Read this line in plain English now. The actor attempts to search the DuckDuckGo for Panda. That's concise and intuitive. The last test step 
should verify that the result links appear after entering a search phrase. Unfortunately, as we remember, this step has a race condition. The result page takes a few seconds to load and display those result links. Automation must wait for those links to appear. Checking too early will make the test case fail. Thankfully, BOA Constrictor makes waiting easy. Read this line in plain English. The actor waits until the appearance of result page links is equal to true. In simpler terms, wait for the result links to appear. Waits until is a special method. It will repeatedly call a question until the answer meets a given condition. For this step, the question is the appearance of result links on the result page. Before links are loaded, the question will return false. Once links appear, it will return true. The condition for waiting is for the answer value to become true. Boa Constrictor provides several conditions out of the box, such as equality, mathematical comparisons, and even string matches. You can also implement custom conditions by implementing the I condition interface. Waiting is smart. It will repeatedly ask the question until the answer is met, and then it will move on. This makes waiting much more efficient than hard sleeps. If the answer does not meet the condition within the timeout, then the wait will raise an exception. The timeout defaults to 30 seconds, but it can be overridden. Many of Bo Constrictor's web driver-based interactions already handle waiting. Anything that uses a target element, like a click or sending keys or scraping text, will wait for the element to exist before attempting the operation. We saw this in some of the previous example code. However, there are times when explicit weights are needed, like here. Interactions that query appearance or existence do not automatically wait. The final step is to quit the browser. Bowl Constrictor's quit web driver task does just that. If you don't quit the browser, then it will remain open and turn into a zombie. Always, always quit the browser. Furthermore, in whatever test framework you use, put the steps to quit the browser in a cleanup or teardown routine so that it is called even when the test fails. And there we have our completed test using Boa Constrictor's screenplay pattern. All the separated concerns come together beautifully to handle interactions in a much better way. Screenplay pattern can be used for more than web UI interactions. Boa Constrictor has interactions for REST APIs using REST Sharp as well. Let's quickly step through a REST API test. The actor is the same as before. To call REST APIs, the actor needs an ability named call REST API. It uses a REST Sharp REST client with a base URL. For this test, we will use a public API called dog API, which returns random pictures of cute dogs. One actor can have multiple abilities as long as each ability has a different type. Boa Constrictor uses REST Sharp's REST request objects directly which specify things like resource path and HTTP method. To call the REST API, Boa Constrictor uses this call. The actor calls the REST request using that given request object. We can then check the response object for response code and other data. This test is quite basic. But Boa Constrictor can do some advanced tricks, such as downloading files, dumping responses, and automatically deserializing response bodies. REST API interactions may also be composed with web UI interactions. As we said before, the screenplay pattern can be summed up in one line. Actors use abilities to perform interactions. It's that simple. Actors use abilities to perform interactions. For those who like object-oriented programming, 
The screenplay pattern can be seen in a sense as a solid refactoring of the page object convention. Solid refers to five design principles for maintainability and extensibility. Single responsibility, open closed, list golf substitution, interface segregation, and dependency inversion. Now, I won't go into detail about each of these principles because that information is pretty tense. But if you're interested, take a quick snapshot of this table here and check out each of these principles later. Wikipedia is actually a pretty good source. You'll find that the screenplay pattern follows each of these quite nicely. So why should you use the screenplay pattern over page object convention or raw web driver calls. There's a few key reasons. First, the screenplay pattern, and specifically BOA constrictor, provide rich, reusable, reliable interactions out of the box. BOA constrictor already has tasks and questions for every type of web driver based interaction. Each one is battle hardened and safe. Second, Screenplay interactions are composable. Like we saw with searching for a phrase, you can easily combine interactions. This makes code easier to use and reuse, and it avoids lots of duplication. Third, the screenplay pattern makes waiting easy using existing questions and conditions. Waiting is one of the toughest parts of black box automation. Fourth, Screenplay calls are readable and understandable. They use a fluent-like syntax that reads more like prose than code. Finally, the screenplay pattern at its core is a design pattern for any type of interaction. In this talk, I showed how to use it for web UI interactions and I briefly teased REST API interactions. But you could use it for anything, such as mobile apps, uh, command line, other APIs, all because you can make your own interactions it is completely customizable. Overall, the screenplay pattern provides better interaction for better automation. That's the point. This isn't just another Selenium WebDriver wrapper. It's not just a new spin on page objects. Screenplay is a great way to exercise any feature behaviors under test. And as we saw before, screenplay pattern isn't that complicated. Actors use abilities to perform interactions. That's it. The programming behind it just has some nifty dependency injection. If you'd like to start using screenplay pattern for your test automation, there are a few ways to get started. If you're programming in C Sharp, you can use Boa Constrictor, the library I showed in these examples. If you're programming in Java or JavaScript, you can use Serenity BDD, a mature, complete test automation framework that includes the screenplay pattern. Serenity BDD greatly influenced Boa Constrictor, but the two are entirely separate projects. Boa Constrictor is not Serenity BDD for .NET. Instead, Boa Constrictor aims to be a simpler, standalone implementation of screenplay. If you're programming in Python, then hold on to your seats. <laughs> Python is personally my favorite language, and I think it's one of the best languages for test automation. In my spare time, I've been developing a screenplay implementation of Python. It'll be like Boa Constrictor, but the code will be even simpler because it's Python. If none of these options suit you, then you could create your own. Screenplay pattern does require a bit of boilerplate code, but it's worthwhile in the end. <coughs> and if you wanted to make your own, you can always reference code from Boa Constrictor and Serenity BDD because our projects are open source. If you want to learn more about Boa Constrictor, please visit the doc site. It provides thorough information about the project and the screenplay pattern. I recommend taking the hands-on tutorial so you can develop a test automation project yourself with Boa Constrictor. Covers both the web UI and REST API interactions we saw today.
Also, since Boa Constrictor is open source, the team and I would love for you to contribute. So thank you so very much for taking the time to learn more about Screenplay and Boa Constrictor with me today. Again, my name is Andy Knight, and I'm the Automation Panda, as well as Developer Advocate at Apple Tools. Be sure to read my blog, follow me on Twitter, and reach out to me if you'd like to join the Boa Constrictor project. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. That was a really good, uh, really good in-depth. You covered a ton of information. Completely agree with you on uh, your assessment of Python. I really think that most modern <laughs> that I've seen, you know, tend to tend to be fairly close to what the app itself is being written in. Just for mm -hmm. one, for ease of use of everyone's already got their head around that that tech stack, and also convincing developers to contribute to the test framework. Right. That's that's the big win. So mm -hmm. it, it's really between Python and JavaScript today. Uh, those are the two big key technology stacks that are, yeah, interchangeable. I mean, they, once you learn the syntax of one, you can figure out the other one and it's really simple. So completely agree. Um, I think, I'm not sure if there's questions that are waiting. Um, I don't see any from the moderator at this point. I'll just give people a couple minutes in case they have questions for you or, or want to ask you anything sure. directly. Sure. I mean, ask me anything, whether it's screenplay, uh, bow constrictor, Python, testing, software, ask me about my cars, ask me about my puppy, whatever. <laughs> I'm interested to hear a little bit more about what you're going into with, with Python um, and what direction you're going with screenplay with that, uh, because it, it's really prescriptive. Screenplay itself, if you read the stuff from, I think it's, it's a Ferguson Smart. John Ferguson Smart that does that. Um, it's pretty prescriptive about what he likes to use, but I think it's cool that you're coming up with your own your own wrapper for that. So we you talk a little bit more about that, maybe. Sure, sure. So um, actually, I'd like to first chat a little bit more broadly about my vision and approach to screenplay, and then I can talk about Python. Um, yeah, that's exactly what I meant. Thank you. Sure, sure, sure. So a uh, li little bit of backstory. When I joined Precision Lender back in April 2018. Um, that was my previous company. I was hired to be their first software engineer in test. They didn't have any test automation beyond some unit tests. Uh, they, uh, <laughs> they didn't know how to go about building a high scale test automation project. Like it was all new to them. So when I came in, they're like, Andy, keys to the kingdom, go make it happen. I'm like, oh, okay, this, this is really cool, you know? And so I basically built up that, that project. Uh, I called it BOA because of tongue in cheek reasons. If, uh, uh, Precision Lender was and still is a Microsoft.net shop. And so when I came in there, it was like, okay, the choice for language for, that, is, that we're gonna use is either gonna be C Sharp or Python. Um, and even though I'm a Python guy at heart, it made sense to do it in C Sharp because that's what the company did. You know, I went with what was already there. I'm like, okay, totally cool. So if yeah, I, can't I think have the your name is good because you, you may have been a little constricted on the choices that you had, right? <laughs> a little play there, right? So, yeah. So um, we started building the project and the, the way I approached it was to go lean. That's one of my software testing convictions, you know, add, add value as you go. And <laughs> when it's like, okay, you already have this massive web application with all of these various parts and components and it's been going for almost a decade and you're now coming in starting to try to get some protection on there. It's like, oh geez, um, you gotta go lean. So it's like, okay, let's, you know, we got Specflow in place at the time, Selenium WebDriver was still king. Cypress at that time was still like brand new and it didn't support other browsers other than Chrome. And we're like, well, our banking customers use IE, so we can't do that. Playwright did not exist yet. So, okay, we're using Selenium WebDriver. So I got some basic tests, you know, smoke tests. I got them running. Locally, I got them running overnight. Um, and originally, I was using page objects because, like, okay, this is like bootstrapping, just get a lean, get everything up and going. And after the first few dozen tests, I realized very quickly, just as I had realized at my previous job at LexisNexis, these page objects ain't going to cut it. <laughs> this, this, this ain't it. This ain't it. This, this sucks. So I was like, shoot, what was the alternative? I know about screenplay pattern. And I wanted to use that, but there was no major .NET implementation, right? Serenity BDD 
is um, Java and JavaScript. Also, another thing that I saw with, with the Serenity projects that um, kind of, I don't, I don't want to say it put me off, but just one thing that, that you have to recognize is that Serenity is a full comprehensive framework, right? It's not just screenplay. It's you get the reporting, you get, the, you get all the other things that come with it. I was like, well, I don't necessarily want all the other things. I just want a screenplay implementation that I can use, that I can pop into my own framework that I'm building. And so with that in mind, I was like, okay, well, it looks like, A, I'm going to need to make my own screenplay pattern in or screenplay implementation in C Sharp. And secondly, I want it so that anyone else in the .NET space could plug and play use it, right? So that they wouldn't have to like throw out their old projects and start over with serenity.net that I would make or something like that. I wanted it so that like, okay, I would, there would be just like a NuGet package, a library that you just kind of stick in. And, you know, now instead of making web driver calls directly, you're making screenplay calls. And that was the vision for the project. Um, yeah, I think that's really smart. And it's good to be, it's good mm -hmm. that you had the opportunity in the kind of company that would allow you to do that, right? Because that's a, that's a big limiter in a lot of us in testing, especially mm -hmm. is time resources and, and budget for it. Mm -hmm. And if you've got, if you've got buy-in from leadership to allow you to build something like that, that's that's irreplaceable. Um, and then yep. you see the difference that it makes immediately when you can start building things that other people use. That's that's pretty satisfying stuff. Mm -hmm. Yep. And so, like, it's, it's funny because when it started, I did not start it with the intention explicitly of making it a standalone open source project. It was literally just like another package within our, our proprietary, proprietary uh, test automation project. Uh, sure. The Bo we call it the BOA solution. Okay. Okay. Solution because in .NET you have solutions and then projects. We have the BOA solution. And anyway, um, so it was literally just hanging out as you know a, a a project within our solution. But I always had it in the back of my mind. It's like I would eventually someday like for this to be released open source. Um, the first time I had brought it up after it had attained a level of maturity, my, I hate to say it, my VP was kind of like. He said no without saying no. He was like, no, it's nice. No, I don't know. I'm like, Where's the direct revenue? Yeah, right. Yeah, that kind of thing. And I'm just like, yeah. mm -hmm. but then um, in 2020, um, it's funny. Our chief product officer came knocking on my door, and he had this this vision for things. Um, anyway. Uh, he he wanted to to pursue quote unquote radical transparency with the with the customers and wondering how we could leverage our our testing practices and processes and stuff that we do for that. And I was like, here's my opportunity. Well, if you want to show our customers uh, what we do, if you want to you know pull back the curtain, show them inside the factory, one thing we could do is we could open source part of our test code. But like, do it I'm like. <laughs> <laughs> and so that was the gateway to that was that was like a high level approval to say okay we'll take we can take this part of our project and release it as an open source uh, project for others to be able to use and consume. And so well, and then that, that has returns associated with it too because then your company gets associated with that and then you yeah. get more revenue from the company which gets you more budget and so on and so forth right. Mm -hmm. So and I think that's really smart. That's why I wanted you to go into that mm -hmm. a little bit. I think that's really smart lessons for people yep. who maybe haven't been involved in you know, high level test architectures or test leadership. That's the fight mm -hmm. that you, it often goes unheard and unseen. And I think that's, mm -hmm. that's really important to bring to the community. So thanks for, thanks for going a little bit uh, in depth on that. Yeah. I think that's awesome. Yep. Yeah, and I mean, it's, it's, it's good for the company in that sense, right? It's, it's, it reveals things to the customers. It helps everything you mentioned with that. It also helps with talent and recruitment because, I mean, think about it. If you're a software engineer, whether you're a developer or a tester, that whatever specific role you do, I categorize everybody, you're an engineer in the software space. Um, if you can, it's one thing to tell people what you do. Like I can tell you, oh yeah, when I was at PL, I was software engineer and test. But when I can show you publicly what I've done, you know, I can point to the GitHub repository and say, there's our open source project that my team and I put out. You know, that's very powerful. That's like evidence, that's proof. And yep. it shows like, hey, you know, what it when you as an engineer inevitably go search for new opportunities, you can carry that with you and show, hey, you know, this is this is what I've actually worked on. You can see our our workmanship, our craft. And that that 
um, is an enticement to, for companies to say, hey, you know, we do support open source. We support our engineers on these projects because as an engineer, I would like to work for a company that does that. So I'm going to be attracted to companies that will have open source programs that I can contribute to because then, you know, it helps the company and it also helps me. <laughs> so companies yeah. who do that will get better talent. That's a really good point. And, and you know, too, as, as you know, somebody myself that's come up through testing from, from the ground up, um, mm. you don't have to have a lot of those conversations on, on winning someone over on those concepts because you know coming into a company like that, it's already rooted. If they're embracing open yeah. source, you know that that's, that cat's yeah. out of the bag and there's no putting it back in at that point. Exactly, exactly. Um, it's, it's, it's a very cool thing. <laughs> and, and not common. Um, so I, mm -hmm. I do want to say that, you know, this is a, it's a pretty cool thing and it's awesome to be a part of. And all that does is give you more energy into the next thing that you want to do. It gets addictive exactly. in a good way. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I will say like, I mean, it, I, I wouldn't say it was a fight to, to release Boa Constrictors open source, but it was a, a process. It, it was a journey and it took a, it took a long time. Um, it took a lot of work. Um, it, and ultimately, like the, the way we did do it, first of all, there was that chief product officer, but also uh, the company got bought out by a bigger company uh, named Q2. And they had had an open source initiative a few years prior that had started and then fallen flat. And so I was coming in there. And so I was kind of, you know, back, uh, like fighting through old processes, trying to like get things jump started and reinvigorated again. So yeah, I mean, it, sometimes you might have to be the first one. Sometimes you might have to be like, you know, bringing it back up again. Maybe you already have a highway that you can just drive right through. Um, so all different experiences there. Hi highway is a good one. Um, sometimes you just mm -hmm. need a dump truck with reinforcements on the front. You just need to drive right over the barricades, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's right, man. Get a, get a ramp. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> cool. Great, great conversation. Um, I think it, it definitely made me think, definitely made me see mm -hmm. some different sides of things that I hadn't had time to look at in recent years. So thank you for bringing that. I think it's going to generate a lot of good buzz and, and get some more people looking at your open source uh, offering there. Cool, man. Glad to hear it.